the way they portray me on TV as a grumpy guy, that's, that's, that's not even close. I'm way more than a grumpy guy because I like to get stuff done now and not pansy around doing it. Come on, go. God. I'm Cowboy and I do most of the prepping, a lot of the woodwork here at Rick's Restorations. I like to build things. I like to work with my hands. Things that are harder to do, I do. Because I'm good at it. Okay, so let me ask you. How many of you have ever played, hook, have played hooky from school, pretend to be sick? Okay. How many of you ever played hooky from work, pretending to be sick? All right. How many of you played hooky from church, pretending to be sick? Uh, okay, good. How many of you lie on <laughs> surveys like this so you don't look so bad? <laughs> okay, all right, thank you for that. Thank you. All right, we got some honest ones in here at least. That's good. All right, cool. <laughs> you know, um, somebody once said, honesty may be the best policy, but it's important to remember that apparently, by elimination, dishonesty is the second best policy. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> that may be, it may not be. Let me just welcome you to week number three of our brand new series called The Secret. And in this series, what we're doing is we're talking about the secret to happiness. I know our world seems to think that there is a secret to happiness hidden somewhere away in God's Word and that it's kind of like it's sort of up to us to be able to find that or to dig it out or to discover it or whatever the case might be. But you know what? Um, a lot of us think that God is the one who is actually trying to hide that from us, and He really doesn't want us to find it, or else, or else He wants to really has to really have to work for it, or all those different kind of things. But you know what? If there's anyone in this entire universe who sincerely wants you to be happy, it would be God. He's the one, the one who really wants us to be happy in all different way, in all ways. Uh, he is not trying to hide it from us. Uh, he hasn't tried to hide it from us, nor is He ever going to try to hide it from us. He simply wants us to know what, what, who he is and what he's about and those kind of things. So we're, that's what we're kind of what we're talking about in this series. Uh, let me just say as we begin, though, that we have a team of, uh, of supporters uh, here at gracelife.tv and also online who support us on a regular monthly basis that kind of help keep this message of grace and freedom going out to a world that really needs to hear it. Um, and so let me just welcome you, those of you who are joining us online as well, as well as those of you, user, user, those of you I can say that, who are here today, just glad to have you. Uh, we've got people joining us uh, online all over the United States and literally around the world. So just thank, uh, thank you to those of you who are uh, helping to support us both financially as well as with your spiritual and prayerful support. Uh, you, you can, if you want to uh, donate, uh, especially online, those of you who are viewing us online, you can do that by just going to our website. It's uh, www.gracelife.tv, not .org or .org. Uh, com or dot uh, any of those kind of things. It's dot TV, and you'll find it there. So uh, let me ask you this question: Why are so many people, including including Christians, so unhappy? Why are so many people unhappy today, especially Christians? I, it's my opinion. I think that the reason, one of the reasons, uh, probably the main reason, is that um, that we lack happiness, and many of us feel that our lives today are, you know, uh, not what all that they could be. I think comes from the teachings of religion. That's my opinion. And you can e either disagree or agree. Uh, uh, but because I think that, in my opinion, religion is the, one, is the thing that keeps us from being happy more than, uh, than all of the other factors combined. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, what I mean is that because of the fact that religion always teaches us that uh, there's, there's something more that you need to be doing for God. Uh, always, uh, religion always teaches that, that that, that the root cause of, of your unhappiness and or your lack of fulfillment in life is because you're just not doing enough for God, you know? Well, I totally disagree. As a matter of fact, uh, the Bible also disagrees. Uh, we've been taught that we're supposed to be on this hamster wheel for God, you know, that you just do more and more and more. And if you're not happy, then you just need to do more. But it's a, it's a hamster wheel is, what, is really what it is. Because what happens is, is that the more we do, the more wore out we get and the less happy we feel and all those different kind of things. It's kind of the hurrier I go, the behinder I get kind of a thing, you know. No matter how much you do, it's never enough. It's never enough. The preacher's always going to tell you you've got to do more. 
So I think you'll be happy to know that God paints quite a different picture in, in His Word. He doesn't ever tell us that. Uh, since the majority of us have probably been brought up uh, to believe that there's something more that we must be doing for God, uh, that God expects you to be doing stuff for Him, we've probably never been given permission to just kind of sit back and relax for a while. Uh, most of us have probably been, never been told that we can, you know, we can say no, you know, to some things. Uh, that we can uh, relax in our lives, that we can do the things that God has called us to do. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 5, 8, he says, if it, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and that, that literally we talked about that last week, and that's what we're going to do in here today, a little bit of recap to start with to kind of get you on the right track. If, if you don't take care of your own self, that's what he's talking about there, your own self. First of all, and especially for those of his own household, okay, there, we talked about that. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Uh, he's talking specifically about you. He's saying, if you don't care for yourself, first of all, you're not going to be able to care for anybody else, and especially not even your own family. You've got to take care of yourself first of all. Of course, that includes putting God first in your life, you know. That includes that God is at the top of the list of the things that we find most important in my life. That's putting me first, is when I put God at the top of my list. So if we don't take care of our own self, we're not going to be able to help others either. Okay, one final thing before we go on uh, and talk about what we're going to talk about today is a lot of us, I, the, one of the questions I had when I read this, and I read it many, many, many times, and I thought, well, it never really uh, hit me until just uh, this couple weeks ago when he says that you're, if, you, if, you're, if you don't take care of your own self and, and then uh, your members of your own household, I mean your immediate family, those that are living with you, that you're worse than an unbeliever. Well, what could be worse than an unbeliever? I mean, an unbeliever is on their way to hell, right? I mean, they've rejected Jesus Christ. They don't know who God is, nor do they care about God at that point in time in their lives. What's worse than an unbeliever? Uh, well, uh, you know, if you look in the New Testament and you look at what Jesus did, you'll find out that he didn't have problems with unbelievers. Who did he have problems with? He had problems with the scribes and the Pharisees because he constantly was calling them hypocrites, whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. That's worse. That's what's worse than an unbeliever, in my opinion, is that those who hold others to a higher standard than they hold themselves, than they hold to themselves, those who hold others to a higher standard than they hold to themselves, than they keep themselves, okay? So Jesus was more upset about hypocrisy of the Pharisees and hypocrisy of anybody, for that matter, than he was about almost anything else. Okay, so today, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be talking about no brag, just fact. And I want you to recall to your memory the video clip we just saw with Cowboy. How many of you, how many of you watched American Restoration? Okay, I, I love that show. I do. I just love it. Uh, people bring in old, you know, old beat up junk stuff, just rusted out, all that kind of thing. And, and, uh, and Rick brings that stuff to, back to just, I mean, better than factory. You know, it's amazing what they do with that stuff. And Cowboy is one of the workers there. Been with Rick uh, from Rick's Restoration for 20 years or some such thing. And he is the grouchiest, grumpiest guy you'll ever want to meet, you know. But he's right. He says, I do, the, I do the hard stuff, I do the, 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 you know, the technical stuff because I'm good at it. Uh, I'm going to tell, tell you that, that even though he's grumpy and he's got, you know, he's got this inflated opinion of himself and he doesn't seem to like anybody else, all that kind of stuff, you know, he, I think he's being honest there. I, I think he's being up front that he says, I'm good at it. And he knows he's good at it. And that's okay. Okay. So most of us probably aren't quite as honest with ourselves as we might like to think we are. Um, as a matter of fact, because we most often choose to measure ourselves against the performance of others, uh, most of us do that to some degree or another. We measure our, our performance against the performance of others. We often become an, unable to see ourselves in an honest light. Um, let me give you an example. When I was in high school, and that's been 40 years ago, <laughs> I don't know, bazillion years ago, uh, the Carpenters were actually my favorite uh, group. I liked their harmony. I liked the songs they did. I still do. I still like the, you know, the, the, techni the technical parts of their music, all those different kind of things. are just really good, really awesome. Uh, however, um, 
No, well, again, that may be partly because the Carpenters were the number one group between 1970 and 1980, the number one top-selling, you know, most important group, American group. Uh, their career, however, abruptly ended uh, when Karen Carpenter died on February the 4th of 1983. They were, they were the top group for 10 years there, and three years later, uh, she's, she's dead from heart failure. However, the heart failure wasn't caused from a, a congenital disease or any of those kind of things. It was caused by chronic anorexia nervosa. In other words, she, she saw herself as being fat. And it didn't matter how thin she got, and I've seen pictures of her when she, when she did, when she was uh, coming near death, of, uh, you know, and uh, I, it just barely, a little bit of skin hanging on some bones is all that's left. And yet every time she looked in the mirror, she saw a person who was still too fat, right? She was still an ugly, fat person. That's what she thought. So let me ask you this question. Uh, and it's a real easy one. You won't have any problem with answering it. Do you think that Karen, Car Karen Carpenter had a proper self-image? Do you think that she was being honest with herself about what she looked like? Obviously not. Obvious, but she thought she was, right? She thought she was. Um, now let me ask you another question. Did changing her physical appearance bring her the happiness that she was looking for? No, it didn't, did it? It didn't, not at all. And a lot of us try to do that as well. We try to change a lot of different things in our lives that really aren't where the problem lies to begin with because her addiction was merely the symptom of a much deeper mental and spiritual uh, disorder where the image that she had of herself was, was terribly skewed. She, she couldn't see herself for who she really was. Uh, kind of like walking in front of one of those wavy mirrors. Have you ever been uh, to a place where they have one of the wavy mirrors? And you, or even in the side of a car, you know? You look at yourself or in a win window, the side window in a car, and, you know, you, you look a whole lot different, right? Well, that's how she saw herself in a regular flat mirror. She, uh, she just couldn't see herself any other way. <clears throat> so it's my opinion that every last one of us, and that's my opinion, that every last one of us suffers to a greater or lesser degree from an inability to be totally honest or to honestly evaluate what and who we are. Now, I think we all struggle with that in, in some form or some degree or another. But it's not just our physical appearance that we struggle with a lot of times. And some people I know don't seem to, but, and others seem to quite, uh, quite a bit. Uh, but not just our physical uh, appearance and abilities, but probably even more specifically in the spiritual gifts and abilities that God has given us. Because I think that if we could have come to an understanding of the spiritual abilities and gifts that God has given us to use specifically, uh, we would see ourselves probably in a lot different light. In other words, we often listen to what others say about our gifts and our talents and our abilities and all those different kind of things instead of letting Jesus guide us and to show us who, is, who He has created us to be. Uh, the, fact, the fact is, without Jesus, it's impossible to even know who we are. It's not possible. Without Jesus in your life, you cannot really even know who you are. Uh, we can't honestly assess ourselves unless we have Jesus there to, to guide us and to show us who we are. Because, because of the fact that Jesus is, is not only the only one who has made us to be who and what we are, but His opinion of us is the only one that really counts. Not only is He the one that created us to be who we are, but His opinion is the one that really counts. Nobody else's. So check out what Paul says about this problem in Romans chapter 12 and verses 3, 3, 4, and 5. He says, For through the grace given to me, <clears throat> excuse me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have a sound judgment, as God has allotted each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Okay, so there's several things there that I think are important for us to see. Um, and, and we're going to talk about that here today. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I think that we need to know our bragging rights. Like Cowboy, I think he knew his bragging rights, at least to that degree. I think he was a, he's, a, he's too much of a bragger otherwise, and he's really hard on other people. But we need to know our bragging rights, number one, 
We need to think honestly about ourselves. Okay? Third thing is that we need to will it, be willing to step out and to do what God has gifted us to do. Okay? Know your bragging rights. Uh, be honest about, your, about yourself, about who you are. And then be willing to step out and do what God has gifted you to do. Okay, so the first aspect involved in being honest with and, and about ourselves is to know our bragging rights. Let's start there. Um, so how many of you have ever met somebody who, who can always do things better than you can? Yeah, all of us probably have. We've already all probably met someone that no matter what story you tell, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter where you've been, they've already been there, they've already done that, and they did it better, longer, and bigger, and, and, and all that stuff than you ever, ever dreamed about doing, right? You know, it, it's kind of hard to hang around people like that because <laughs> no matter what you say, they're going to they're gonna one-up you, you know, and you finally just have to go, oh, okay, you know, whatever. Let it go, right? Uh, so look at what Paul says about knowing our bragging rights. He says, for through... The grace given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think more highly of himself than you ought to think. For we ha have many members in one body, and the members do not have the same function. What he's saying there is, listen, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. It's pretty simple, straightforward, not that hard. The assumption here is that all of us at some point in time or another are tempted to try to make ourselves look better than what we really are. That's the idea. That all of us are tempted at some point in time in our lives to make ourselves look better than what we really are. I heard about three little boys who were in the schoolyard and they were talking together and bragging about their dads, you know, like little boys will do. Yeah, well, my dad can do this and my dad does that. And one of the first little boys says, you know what? They were, kind of, they were actually kind of bragging about how much money their dads made, you know. My dad's a rich, richer than your dad is, you know, those kind of things. And so the first boy, he says, well, my dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper and he calls it a poem. And they give him 50 bucks. No problem. Second little boy says, you know what? That's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper and he calls it a song. And they give him 100 bucks. Third little boy stands up and he said, you know, <clears throat> my dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. Calls it a sermon. It takes five men to pick up all the money. <laughs> Well, bragging rights, right? Uh, we all want to brag about who or what we are or what we have or what, all those different kind of things. So Paul says in verse 3, listen, the only way we can accurately assess ourselves is by not only knowing Jesus personally, by having him live personally within our lives, but also knowing what he has already accomplished on our behalf. That he's already taken care of all those things that we think we need to take care of for God. That sins aren't the issue. Jesus died on the cross to, to, to pay the penalty for sin. And not for us only, but for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, 2. Check it out. Um, because Paul continues in verse 4 that because even though all of us, we're all different, right? There's not, a two, not any two of us that are the same. Not exactly the same. I don't care even if you're twins. I don't care if they're, you're so much twins, you, they can't tell you apart. You still are different than the other person. And we all do things differently than anyone else does it. Um, but that doesn't mean that any one of us is any better than the other one. It's just different. It's not better. It's just different. You do it different than I do. Cool. But that doesn't make the way you do it better than the way I do it. How many of you worked for a boss who, who you knew how to do it better than they did? I mean, seriously. Yeah, we've all done that, haven't we? We've worked for people who, they just go by the book. You know, they told you to do something, you do it their way, and that's the way it is. And you know it's going to fail. You, you know it ain't going to work, but you have to do it anyway, right? Okay. Well, we know that. But we all stand on equal footing. We all stand on equal footing. And our, they're really, in the, in the spiritual sense... In what we do for the Lord Jesus Christ, there isn't any one of us that does it better than the next one, you know? As a matter of fact, if you stop and think about it, that's exactly what not only makes us able to function in the body of Christ, that's what he says here, it's also what makes us complete, because we're all different. <laughs> if we were all the same, we wouldn't be complete. And Paul goes into, spends a lot of time talking about that in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, I think, where he says, you know what? <laughs> if all of us were an eyeball, 
we'd be all in, we'd be in trouble. Where, how would we get around, right? Uh, all those different kind of things. Just because the next guy can't do what I do and I can't do what he does doesn't mean that either of us is inferior to the other or superior because, you know, feet walk and eyes see, right? But without the eyes, the feet will stumble and without the, without the feet, the eyes won't see very much of the world. It takes all of us to be complete. So the point is, is don't try to make yourself look better than, than the next guy. However, since some of us have, have the opposite problem, Paul ta also talks about the other side of that issue. Some of us have the opposite problem, that we never see ourselves as, as good as anybody, as anybody else. We're always at the bottom of the totem pole. And so Paul says, listen, the other side of this issue is that, that we are to be honest about what we can do. So for some of us, that's really difficult to be honest about what we can do. Uh, some of us always constantly put ourselves down and, and lower ourselves below everybody else. Maybe it's kind of a, it's probably a spiritual problem where we think that that's the godly thing to do. Well, it's not. It's not. So while it's absolutely true that we need to be careful not to exaggerate or to brag our, about ourselves, uh, we shouldn't put ourselves down either. I think when we, as a matter of fact, as I think about that, if we do that, we're actually uh, dissing God. Uh, we're actually saying that God created something that is not worthwhile. We think we're pointing it at ourselves, but it's probably more like we're pointing it at God, saying God created me in a, in a defective way, right? Uh, so I think that aspect of this whole idea is as much the point here as, a, as the point is not bragging about yourself. We all want to focus on where Paul said, well, don't brag about yourself. You know, don't think of yourself more highly than not to. But I think the other side of that is as much of the point as the first one is. Don't think of yourself as less than what you are either. You need to be honest about who and what you are, you know. So look at what he says next. He's next, he says, instead of bragging, think as so as to have sound judgment. That's what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, well, you know, we can think, think of ourselves too highly, but we also can think of ourselves as being too low as well, not worth anything. So he says, think as so as to have sound judgment. Sound judgment means honesty on both sides of the picture. On both sides of that picture. I think we need to use the good sense God gave a horse. I'll change that because uh, I've ridden mules for many, many years, and I, quite honestly, I think a mule is a lot smarter than a horse. <laughs> uh, they are. That's my opinion. I've ridden mules a lot, of, a lot of mules and a lot of horses, and I think that mules are way smarter than horses by far. People think they're dumb because they don't do things or won't do things that you want them to do. They're just not going to hurt theirself. You can stay on their back. You're okay. <laughs> but they're not going to hurt theirself. They might hurt you in the process, but they're not going to hurt themselves. So sound judgment means to honest, be honest on both sides of this picture. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of the putting, put your money where your mouth is kind of a thing. Uh, don't end up having to eat your words. Uh, we also need to be honest about our abilities, you know, because we all have limitations as well as abilities. Just that some of us focus more on our abilities and our limitations, and some of us focus more on our limitations than we do our abilities. Neither is fair. Neither is fair. So Peter says, about the, look, Peter says about this subject in 1 Peter 5, he says, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time. Let Him do that. Let Him do that part of it. We cannot allow Him to be that, that God that He is. Third aspect involved in being honest with and about ourselves is simply to step out and do what God has gifted you to do. You know, don't become a braggart and don't put yourself down. Be honest about what you, who and what you are. Thirdly, then, after you've done that, after you're being honest about what you can do, not being overly, overly, uh, you know, uh, happy with yourself and not be under happy with yourself, not think yourself more highly or more lowly than you should, realize what your gifts and your talents and your abilities are, and then be willing to step out and to use those gifts and the talents in God's kingdom, what he's gifted you to do. So verse 3 says, For through the grace given to me, I say to you, so on and so forth. He says, 
as God has allowed it to each a measure of faith. Now, it's not talking about that he gives more faith to some than he does to others. He's just think, simply saying that each of us has different gifts and different abilities. And we all can do things that God has, give, has gifted us to do. There's not a single one of us that, is, uh, that doesn't have a gift that's been given to us directly by God. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that. All of us have been given at least one gift from God specifically for you and no one else. Meaning there is no other person on the face of... Listen carefully. There is no other person on the face of this earth, earth that can fill your shoes. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. There is no other person on the face of this earth can fill your shoes, can do what you do. Period. Because Ephesians 4 tells us that the whole body is fit together in that way. That that's what makes us a body. We're all different, right? We talked about that a minute ago. He says, for from whom the whole body, that's from God, being fitted and held together by, by every, whatever joint supplies, right? With all these different joints, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Because we all work together just like the human body does. We all work together. And we all have our own abilities and all those different kind of things. This hand can't do the same thing this hand can. can. They look the same. They work the same. But they don't do the same things, do they? No. Everything's different. It's all different. I was at the eye doctor here a few weeks ago just to have my eyes checked again for the first time in about three or four years. <laughs> And come to find out they haven't gotten any worse. You know, as a matter of fact, one eye's gotten better. But he said he told me, this is what he told me, I was to tell you. Is he said, and he looked at my eyes and you know he tested them, see what I could see out of each one, those kind of things, and he said, he said, Man, you got the best of both worlds. That one eye sees far away and the other one sees close up. You know, really. So you really don't need glasses in that sense of the word because the one eye reads up close, the other one looks far away, can see things far away. So I got the best of both worlds, you know? So he said, you know, you really don't need glasses. I do use glasses to drive so that the one eye that doesn't see so good far away sees better. Other than that, I just don't need glasses. Just don't hardly ever use them, you know? And, and that's the working together that, we're ta that he's talking about here. That we all know the things that we're able to do, things that we're good at, things that we're gifted at, and it's not a sin to step forward and do what you're good at. That's what Cowboy said. I'm doing this because I'm good at it. That's not a sin. That's not a sin. That's not bragging. It's saying, this is what God has given me to do, and I can do that. And I'm willing to do that. I want to do that. So, God, the fact is, God wants us to use those things for that purpose. And I think that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 5.19 when he says, Don't quench the Spirit. The Spirit has given you gifts and abilities and talents, and he says, Use them. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't, don't put them down. Okay. So, uh, you know, if there's a secret to happiness, I don't think there is. Uh, I think it's just a matter of knowing who we are in God's kingdom. And within that whole realm, then, what we need to, do, we need to be honest about ourselves you know, we need to identify the gift that God has given us. We need to be honest about our abilities. And then we need to step, be willing to step forward and do what God has gifted us to do. You know what? It's the same thing that uh, Mark Twain said many years ago. If you find what you love to do, uh, you'll never work a day in your life. Right? Do what you love to do and you'll never work a day in your life. That's exactly what God says. He, all he did was paraphrase what God said. Know what your gifts and your abilities are and then do that. Do that to bless the lives of others. Step up forward with confidence, knowing that your ability to fill that need was given to you by God Himself. No brag, just fact. Remember that, what was that, the real McCoys? Where Grandpa always said, no brag, just fact? Always like that. As a matter of fact, to hold back, to hold back with what we know that we can do, is to rob ourselves and others of a great blessing. And we don't want to do that. If you're going to rob yourself of a blessing, 
you're going to rob others of blessing. Listen, uh, step out. Be the warrior that God has called you to be. Do what God has called you to do. God's awesome. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Lord bless you all. Amen.